This is the fourth and the final week of this message series from Little Things, Big Things Come, or Big Things Grow. So I begin this, as I began this series, I was conscious of the language of the scriptures that mark the first three weeks. They all mentioned the eleven, or the apostles, as being the group that Jesus was speaking to as he gave the final message before returning to the Father. We read further into the Acts of the Apostles, we know that there is a great crowd who heard Peter preach and they became followers. But it was these initial conversations with, between Jesus and the Twelve who were his faithful followers. It was this small community who were to become powerful witnesses. It's a reminder to us that God starts with us and he then invites us to take his message out to the world to make disciples of all people. And that was what he said to them on the Feast of the Ascension, where his final words with them were to go out and proclaim the good news of the kingdom. The disciples then did that. They preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that accompanied it. So God was promising that he would send an advocate to be with them because he knew they wouldn't be able to do the work by themselves. And this advocate was going to come, and he was going to be a promise that we might ne never fe need to fear that God will be asking of us something that was impossible to do, because everything that God asks of us is according to his will. Now, to help us understand what that meant, we know that there would be fruits of the Holy Spirit, and Paul speaks about that in the letter to the Ephesians where he tells us we'll be filled with a spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And it's through these gifts that we will begin to change the world. Now we know that when the Holy Spirit did come upon the apostles, it was dramatic. We're told that there were sounds of a great wind, there were tongues of flame appeared above them, and they had the ability to speak in different languages. And they attracted a large crowd, firstly, to try to understand what had actually happened, but then the crowd were amazed because they heard G Peter preaching to them in languages that they understood, their own language, uh, speaking about this risen Jesus. Now, most of the visitors to Rome at that time would have, had, would have heard about the crucifixion, they would have heard that there was a claim that Jesus had risen from the dead. But now they heard these disciples, these men, preaching about this Jesus who had risen. And many of them, as we know, wanted to be saved. In their gospel reading that day, we were reminded that Jesus had promised them that when the spirit of truth comes, he will lead you to the complete truth. And then he makes a promise, and this is the real key to why we proclaim the gospel, it's because he will not be speaking as from himself, but will say only what he has learnt, and he will tell you of the things to come. So when we proclaim the gospel, we are not talking about something from our own imagination, our own story. We are actually relaying and relating the story of God's love for us. So as I've mentioned over these weeks, this message series from Little Things, Big Things Grow. The 11 disciples were the ones given the commission to go out to continue this message. But last week, as we listened to the Gospel of Matthew and the final scene in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus gave the disciples another message, the same message, but he gave it in four words. Go, make, baptize, and teach. As we know, that this message had to be more than just something that they were doing. It had to be something that they were being. And in order for that to happen, there needed to be that metanoia, that change of heart, which is essential if we are to do the will of God. That's why it's important that the Holy Spirit should come into our lives and into the lives of the disciples. Before we look at our readings today for this Feast of Corpus Christi, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on how our vision statement for the parish 
complement is complemented by these feast days. <coughs> In case you've forgotten, the vision statement is that Kingston Channel Catholic Parish is a vibrant Catholic community fed by the Eucharist, empowered by the Holy Spirit, <coughs> going out to make disciples. So let's just think of these days. We begin with community. And the strength of the early group of Christ followers was because there was a unity in the community. Nobody had needed anything. They were looked after and the community prayed together. They supported themselves, each other in their daily living. To do that, we know they'd been empowered by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And that filled them with the power from on high so that they could in fact go out to the world and proclaim that Jesus had risen from the dead and was the saviour of the world. So we come to the part of the statement which says, we're fed by the Eucharist, the bread of life. But before we reflect on what that means for us, let's look briefly at the readings for today. All three readings at some stage mention the ritual sacrifice of the Old Testament. Sacrifices that spoke about the commitment of God, of, of a people to God, made after Moses had told them of the commands of the Lord. We listen to that first reading from the book of Exodus. Moses spoke the, the covenant to the people to which they proclaimed, we will observe all the commands the Lord has given us. So Moses builds an altar in order to arrange a sacrifice. He takes some bullocks and using the blood of the bullocks, half of it poured onto the altar and the other half he put into basins. And he then read again from the Book of the Covenant and after the people had reaffirmed their commitment to the covenant, he then takes the blood and he sprinkles it on the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you containing all these rules. Now, it's not the same language we use, but it's very similar to the language that Jesus spoke in the Gospel passage and which we use each time we celebrate the Eucharist. So the Old Testament reminds us that it is the blood which saves us. Now, as we listen to the letter to the Hebrews, it's fairly obvious that the author of the letter was someone who understood the Jewish liturgical rituals and he was confident in their methods of argument. It suggests that he was a Jew and that the community he's writing to is predominantly a Jewish community. The author compares Jesus' death to the death of animals in the Jewish sacrifices, and in particular, the sacrifice that was celebrated on the Day of Atonement. But here, the author presents Jesus both as the sacrifice as well as being the high priest who celebrates the sacrifice. Now, last weekend I mentioned that the language that Jesus used in speaking about his relationship with the Father caused the high priest to tear his robes and, and shout out, what need of witnesses have we now? You've heard the blasphemy. But the letter to the Hebrews takes this challenge a little further as he looks at the Jewish traditions and rituals and suggests that the, the whole concept of sacrifice, as evidenced by the passage from the book of Exodus, is now being replaced by the one sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God. This is what the author writes. He says, how much more effectively the blood of Christ, who offered himself as the perfect sacrifice to God, can purify our inner self from dead actions so that we do our service to the living God. So this isn't a sacrifice to a God who is back there, but this is the living God who is present with us. This action by Christ is an action that doesn't need to be repeated time and time again, as was done by the sacrifices of the past. This is what he says. He brings a new covenant as the mediator, only so that the people who are called to an eternal inheritance may actually receive what was promised. So his death took place to cancel the sins that had infringed the earlier covenant. 
there's a whole new concept that's been presented here for us. Something we may have heard before, but it's an important concept to think about as we reflect on why we celebrate Eucharist weekly. This passage tells us that when we celebrate the Mass, we're not celebrating a repetition of what happened at the Last Supper or a reenactment. It's the language of memorial. And that's a very different language to just our ordinary language. This language of memorial <coughs> simply says that what happened in the past, the event that occurred on the cross several thousand years, several hundred years ago, is in fact being celebrated in a real moment. It's making present here and now, in a sacramental and real form, the same mystery that was celebrated on the cross. His death and resurrection is real with us. So it involves making present here and now this same mystery. Now that's not an easy concept for us to imagine. Sometimes people ask me, um, why do you smile at the consecration? And it's not because I've suddenly thought of something strange or silly, but it's simply a reminder to me that I'm actually there at the same moment that Jesus lifts up the bread, blesses the cup and proclaims, this is my body, this is my blood. So I'm not an actor. I'm not somebody repeating an event 2,000 years ago as a replay of what happened. The words, the language of memorial says that this is happening at this moment in our history. Now, I'm not going to go into the theology of all of that, but it's really just important that what we celebrate at Mass isn't a reenactment. It's not a memory of what happened. It is a memorial, a re real presentation of what was occurring. Our Aboriginal brothers and sisters can tell us a lot about the dream time and they speak about the fact that this is a living reality, not a recollection of the past. So when we celebrate the meal, the Passover, we are doing something really special. And we see this when we listen to the language that Jesus uses in the Mark's Gospel. He tells us the story of the Passover meal. Now, he organises that the disciples make arrangements for him and everything is prepared as Jesus organised. As the meal proceeds, however, according, if you stop and think, according to the same ritual practices that the Israelites used on the day when they prepared to leave Egypt, Jesus does something different. He took the bread and when he had said the blessing, he broke it and gave it to them. Take it, he said, this is my body. And just as he had taken the bread in the passages about the feeding of the multitudes, when he blesses the bread before distributing, but this time he adds, this is my body. You might remember back to the passage from the, the Luke's Gospel telling us about the disciples on the road to Emmaus. How after talking to them and walking with them, he stopped for a meal. And as he sat with them, he took the bread, said the blessing, and he broke it and handed it to them. And at that moment, their eyes were opened and they recognised him because he was doing what they knew that he had called them to do. But then Jesus in the Last Supper meal does something more extraordinary. He takes the cup filled with wine. And when he returned thanks, he gave it to them. They drank from it, and he said to them, This is my blood, the blood of the covenant, which is to be poured out for many. As I said a moment ago, this is what we started with today. Moses taking the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkling it on the people. But Jesus says that this is my blood, which is poured out for many. In a few minutes, we will enter into what this memorial is about celebrating the saving action, his death and resurrection. As I said before, it's not people watching a replay of something that happened almost 2,000 years ago. But it's as a people sharing in this sacrifice, 
the sacrifice once and for all for the salvation of all the world. Through these weeks of our Easter season, we've been brought to, that have brought to completion Jesus' ministry here on earth. His passion, death and resurrection, we know that something wonderful grew out of that. That was us, the church, the ecclesia, the assembly of God's people. As a community, we are now called to become more powerfully what we, our vision says, a vibrant Catholic community, fed by the Eucharist, empowered by the Spirit, were called to go out to make disciples. That's a wonderful sign that we can give to the world, a reminder that from little things, big things can grow.